For nearly 40 years, General Motors has offered air conditioning systems in its cars and trucks to help make drivers and passengers more comfortable. All during that time, it's been the service technician's responsibility to keep the air conditioning system operating in top condition. There is a direct relationship between AC systems that work correctly and customer satisfaction. Throughout this time, a material called Refrigerant 12, or R12, has been commonly used. It performed its task of cooling vehicle interiors exceptionally well. Not only that, but R12 did its work with a minimum of problems. It is harmless to steel, copper, iron, aluminum, and neoprene, the materials that make up the AC system. And R12 itself is unaffected by exposure to these substances. 525 viscosity mineral oil readily mixes with R12, which is important because the oil circulates throughout the system and lubricates all moving components of the compressor and thermal expansion valve. R12 is neither explosive nor flammable and is non-corrosive except when mixed with moisture. For all of its benefits, however, R12 has a serious flaw. It is a chlorofluorocarbon, or CFC. Scientists believe CFCs contribute to the depletion of the ozone layer, which protects all living things from the harmful ultraviolet rays of the sun. This environmental concern is so important that in 1990, the United Nations passed a rule that eliminates the worldwide production of CFCs, including R12. This rule has an enormous impact on the automotive industry and especially on service technicians. Automobiles are a primary user of R12. Old air conditioning systems that leak, along with service procedures which call for the venting of R12 into the atmosphere, could soon deplete the supply of R12 and are major contributors to the damage being done to the ozone layer. The automotive industry must come up with alternatives that are environmentally friendly. The first step was the recovery and recycling of R12, which began in 1989. Beginning with the 1993 G&U vans and the F car, an alternate refrigerant called R134A will be used in place of R12. By 1995, all new GM vehicles will be manufactured with air conditioning systems designed to operate on R134A. Much like R12, R134A works remarkably well. Its biggest benefit, though, is that it contains no CFCs. R134A is harmless to the AC system materials, including aluminum, copper, neoprene, steel, and iron. It absorbs, carries, and releases heat efficiently, and it is carried well with the synthetic oil specially formulated for it. During the remainder of this video presentation, we'll be discussing four important subjects. First, we'll describe the differences between R12 and R134A. It's important for you to know these differences so you'll understand the importance of not mixing these two refrigerants. Second, we'll show you the changes which have been made to AC systems in order to accommodate R134A. Next, we'll review the safe handling procedures and precautions you should follow when working with R134A. And finally, we'll introduce you to the special equipment and new service procedures you should know when diagnosing and repairing an R134A system. End part one. You should now prepare to take the first part of the test for this course. To take the test, you must have a number two pencil, and the official student attendance and test form in front of you. Make sure the first seven digits of the course number printed in block nine of the student attendance and test form match the first seven digits of the course number printed on the course book and the videotape label. If you do not have the correct materials, stop the video and get them. Begin by placing the student attendance and test form in front of you so that the clipped corner is in the lower right. In the upper left-hand corner of the form, you will see a series of circles below the letters A through E. At this time, you will be filling in the test answers only. At the end of this video, instructions for completing the remainder of the form will be provided. 
This is the only answer sheet you will need for this course. In a moment, you will see the first test question and several possible answers. When you have decided on your answer, completely fill in the circle below the letter corresponding to the correct answer. Since this test will be corrected by computer, it is important that you avoid making stray marks on the paper. If you change your mind about an answer, be sure to erase your first choice completely before marking the correct answer. It is also important to avoid getting dirt or grease on the answer sheet, or folding it, as this may cause the computer to incorrectly score your test. As you take this test, remember that there is no time limit. You may take as much time as you wish to complete the test. You may also review the course book or rewind the videotape to find the correct answer. Begin test part one at line one of the test form. Test part one. Question number one. R12 refrigerant will A, no longer be recovered or recycled. B, be reformulated to become more environmentally friendly. C, be phased out of production. Or D, decrease CFCs in the ozone layer. Question number two. R134A refrigerant, A, cannot be recovered or recycled. B, contains CFCs. C, is not compatible with aluminum. Or D, will take the place of R12. Because older model vehicles equipped with R12 systems will require service in the future, you'll be working with both R12 and R134A for many years. R12 will continue to be provided in a white container. R134A is packaged in a light blue container. The pressure characteristics of each refrigerant is different. R12 boils at minus 21 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level, while R134A boils at minus 16 degrees Fahrenheit, 5 degrees higher. R134A has a pressure of 95 PSI at 85 degrees Fahrenheit. At the same temperature, R12 has a pressure of 91.7 PSI. This difference means that R134A operates at a slightly higher discharge pressure and requires more airflow across the condenser to obtain the same performance as R12. The difference means that gauge readings you've been accustomed to in the past will be somewhat different on this new system. One of the most important differences between the two refrigerants are the lubricants carried throughout the components. R12 uses a mineral-based 525 viscosity oil which is carried with the gaseous refrigerant to coat all internal surfaces of the AC system. Because of the different chemical compositions, 525 oil used in R12 systems is not carried with R134A and therefore will not provide adequate lubrication to components. If the refrigerants are mixed, the compressor will most likely fail due to a lack of adequate lubrication. R134A systems, on the other hand, use what's called a polyalkylene glycol, or PAG, synthetic oil that is specially formulated for use with the refrigerant. Initially, GM will be using several different types of synthetic oils which are produced by different manufacturers, specifically for their own compressors. Although the oils are similar, there are differences in viscosities and additives. These oils should not be mixed between systems or compressor failure could occur. The PAG oil used in compressors manufactured by Harrison has a blue tint for easy identification. When adding PAG oil, make certain to follow the specifications shown on the compressor. Because R134A, R12, and their lubricants should not be mixed, the equipment you use to service these systems should be dedicated. Cross-contamination may lead to expensive problems. End part two. You should now prepare to take the next part of the test for this course. If you are unsure of the answer, you may stop the tape to think about the question, review the course book, or rewind the tape and review it before answering. Test part two. Start this part of the test at line number three. Question number three. 
R134A, A is packaged in a blue container. B operates at a higher discharge pressure than R12. C should not be mixed in an R12 system. Or D, all of the above. Question number four. PAG oil, A, is manufactured by only one company. B is synthetic, not mineral-based. C is always clear and colorless. Or D, all of the above. Question number five. Mixing R134A with R12 in a system will likely cause compressor failure. A, true, or B, false. There are a number of changes to the system for R134A use. One of the most obvious design changes to prevent accidental contamination are the service fittings used throughout R134A systems. Unlike the threaded type service fittings used on R12 systems, the R134A components have metric quick connect access fittings, which require special adapters to access the system. We'll describe how to use these adapters later on in this video presentation. Notice that the valve cores used in each system are quite different. One quick method of identification is that the valve cores are brass on R12 systems and are equipped with an internal spring. Valve cores used on R134A systems are green and have an external spring. With the introduction of R134A systems, new labels have been installed to help you during your service procedures. Notice that the new R134A label tells you which compressor lubricant or PAG oil to use. These new labels can be found on top of the blower housing, on the front of the fan shroud, and on the compressor. As a further aid to identifying the two systems, the fittings are metric threaded and are identified by lines cut into the nut portion. And unlike the lines used on older model R12 systems, all current GM passenger car systems use hoses such as P80 and P90 which are compatible with both refrigerants. As far as new hardware is concerned, there are some differences you should note. To handle the increased high side pressure, there may be a new style condenser or one with a slightly larger capacity. There may also be an improved airflow design using larger capacity engine cooling fans or a dual fan design. In preparation for the transition from one refrigerant to another, all GM vehicles are now using a new universal desiccant that is compatible with both R12 and the new R134A. Desiccant is the material used to absorb any moisture that may have entered the air conditioning system. Once again, when replacing any component, always be sure to use the correct part number to assure compatibility. End part three. You should now prepare to take the next part of the test for this course. If you are unsure of the answer, you may stop the tape to think about the question, review the course book, or rewind the tape and review it before answering. Test part three. Start this part of the test at line number six. Question number six. The service fittings on R134A systems, A, are metric threaded, B, are quick connect, C, require special service tools, or D, all of the above. Question number seven. R134A systems, A, require a smaller condenser than R12 systems, B, operate more efficiently than R12 systems, C, have a higher high side pressure than R12 systems, or D, all of the above. Refrigerant R134A is a chemical which requires safe handling to avoid personal injury. Every time you service an air conditioning system, you should wear safety goggles to protect your eyes. In the event of a sudden refrigerant system discharge, clear and ventilate the area until all of the refrigerant mist is no longer visible. If R134A contacts your eyes, rinse them with cold water and contact a doctor for immediate treatment. Keep the R134A container away from temperatures over 125 degrees Fahrenheit and never expose the refrigerant to an open flame. Do not weld or steam clean near any vehicle installed AC lines or components. 
Before removing any caps or performing any service, clean off the area around the service fittings and connections to prevent dirt or oil from contaminating the system. When removing the service fitting caps, make sure that the high side two-piece access fittings do not unthread from the line. Remember, the system is under pressure and personal injury may result. Be sure to replace these caps when you complete service. Failure to replace them could result in a loss of refrigerant charge. The synthetic lubricants in R134A absorb moisture from the atmosphere rapidly, so you must immediately seal any air conditioning component removed from the system to minimize moisture absorption. When installing a component, keep the caps in place until you are ready to actually perform the installation. Finish the installation without delay, again to minimize exposure to moisture in the air. If you're adding lubrication, it must come from a sealed container. As soon as you're through with the container, seal it again. Lubrication which has become saturated with moisture should be disposed of as it is no longer suitable for use. End part four. You should now prepare to take the next part of the test for this course. If you are unsure of the answer, you may stop the tape to think about the question, review the course book, or rewind the tape and review it before answering. Test part four. Start this part of the test at line number eight. Question number eight. A benefit which R134A has compared with R12 is that R134A will not harm the ozone layer. A, true, or B, false. Question number nine. The valves in R134A system service fittings prevent the loss of refrigerant, so it is not necessary to cap the fittings. A, true, or B, false. If you're already familiar with traditional air conditioning service procedures, you'll find working with R134A is not much different. There are, however, several new tools which you must use. To begin, notice that the removal or installation of a service valve requires the use of special socket J39037. A backup wrench must also be used with this socket. Torque the valve to 7 to 10 foot-pounds during installation. Here's a service procedure you're already familiar with. Before installing a component, coat the O-ring with 525 mineral oil. This will lubricate it and extend its service life. Do not use PAG oil. This will swell the O-rings and cause the fittings to seize. It's okay to use 525 in this one case because the oil will not be carried by the R134A, so it won't have any effect on system components. One of the new tools you'll be using to service R134A systems is the J39400 halogen leak detector, a new essential tool in 1992 for both R12 and R134A systems. It is a heated diode type tester, unlike the self-powered corona discharge type you may have used in the past. The J39400 includes a control unit housed in a shock resistant case, a detector probe with a six-foot flexible hose, a cigarette lighter plug with a 12-foot power cord, and a battery clamp adapter. The control unit contains an on-off power switch, a 12-volt DC jack, a probe balance control, a three-position refrigerant switch for R12, R134A, and gross leaks, a speaker housed beneath the cover, and a built-in pump. There's also a plug-in sensor, a calibrate reference bottle, and complete operating instructions. The detector probe consists of a tip protector, a transparent tip, a tip filter, an airflow ball, and a neon leak signal lamp. In GM's efforts to be a leader in environmental issues, GM engineers established a new official refrigerant leak standard which leak detectors must meet. The J39400 is capable of achieving this standard of detecting one air conditioning system joint leaking one pound of refrigerant over a 40-year time span. 
It is also the only halogen leak detector that will find leaks of this size for both R12 and R134A. Before using the J39400, it must be calibrated correctly. Directions for performing this calibration setup, as well as for using the leak detector, are printed in the operator manual and inside the case. You'll also find the videotape which accompanies this equipment to be extremely helpful. Be sure to review all of the material carefully before using the equipment. One important precaution to follow when using the leak detector is to keep it away from an explosive or combustible atmosphere, such as fuel fumes. The sensor heats up to about 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and the air drawn into the probe and over the sensor could create an explosion. Also, each time you use the leak detector, you must let it warm up for at least two minutes. This warm-up period is critical to ensure accurate and efficient use of the tester. Before attempting to locate a leak, you should perform a system test to determine if there is sufficient refrigerant in the system to do a leak test. If not, you'll have to add some R134A. To begin the leak testing process on an R134A system, set the switch to the R134A gas position. Adjust the balance control to maintain one to two ticks per second. Now you must calibrate the detector by momentarily sniffing the opening in the cap for one to two seconds with the probe. Notice how the neon light in the probe flashes rapidly and the audio pitch increases to maximum. Perform the leak test with the engine off. It doesn't matter where on the system you start the leak detection procedure as long as you continuously follow the system and test all the areas. These include the component fitting connections, the service fittings, all attached sensors and switches, brazed, soldered or welded areas on the lines and components, the hose to line couplings, as well as areas showing signs of damage or corrosion. The tip of the probe must be as close as possible, but no more than one quarter inch away from the connection you're testing. Move the probe slowly, one to two inches per second. If you accidentally dip the tip into grease, it must be taken apart and cleaned. If you bump it against a component, you may get an incorrect leak reading. Completely circle every connection with the probe. Move the probe slowly, again making sure not to touch the hardware. In most cases, the leak will not show up by simply positioning the probe beneath the connection, as you may be used to doing. This is very important. When a leak is detected, the neon light in the probe begins to flash very rapidly and the speaker emits a continuous howl. When the probe is moved away from the leak, the flashing neon light and ticking sound return to normal. Make certain you have really found the exact position of the leak by repeating your test of the area. You should continue searching for leaks throughout the remainder of the system. To isolate a large leak, Move the detector switch to the gross position and adjust the balance control downward. This will help find the exact location of the leak. It's also a good idea to use compressed air to blow out the area when locating the exact position of a large leak. You must return the switch to the proper position and readjust the balance control to continue testing the remainder of the system. The final test is to examine the compressor shaft seal and evaporator. To test the compressor shaft seal, blow compressed air around the front of the clutch pulley for at least 15 seconds to thoroughly clean the area. Then wait one to two minutes before testing the area. If the detector finds a leak and howls at a continuous pitch, the shaft seal must be replaced. If more than two minutes pass before testing, the area will have to be blown out again to get an accurate reading. To test the evaporator in the HVAC case, turn the fan switch to high for 15 seconds, then shut it off and wait 10 minutes. Next, insert the eraser end of a pencil into the condensate drain to check for moisture. It must be dry to avoid drawing condensation into the probe tip. If no moisture is found, 
insert the probe tip into the drain or the hole where the resistor block is mounted. This method works better than trying to detect a leak through the air ducts inside the vehicle. If the detector indicates a leak and howls continuously, the evaporator core may need to be replaced. End part five. You should now prepare to take the next part of the test for this course. If you are unsure of the answer, you may stop the tape to think about the question, review the course book, or rewind the tape and review it before answering. Test part five. Start this part of the test at line number 10. Question number 10. Before you use the halogen leak detector, A, it must warm up for at least two minutes. B, determine if there is sufficient refrigerant in the system. C, neither A nor B is correct. Or D, both A and B are correct. Question number 11. When testing for a leak in an R134A system with a halogen leak detector, the tip of the probe should A, not touch any component. B, be positioned below the connection being tested. C, be lubricated with PAG oil. Or D, all of the above. Question number 12. You must calibrate the halogen leak detector by holding the probe to the calibrate bottle for one to two seconds. A, once when it is new from the manufacturer. B, every time it is turned on. C, at least once per week or D, only if it malfunctions. The newest addition to your service equipment is this essential tool called the ACR4 for air conditioning, refrigerant recovering, recycling, and recharging. The ACR4 is different from the ACR3, which could not perform the recharging service. The ACR4 also has oil injection capabilities to further improve your service efficiency. The equipment has the quick connect couplers that only mate with R134A access fittings. This protects the equipment and the R134A systems from cross-contamination with R12. Before using the ACR4 for the first time, it is critical to review and perform the setup procedures printed in the operator's manual and covered in the accompanying videotape. Spend a few minutes familiarizing yourself with the various components and their locations. Failure to follow the correct procedures could result in vehicle system damage. Located on the control panel are the main power switch, a keypad, LED readout screen, low side and high side pressure gauges, and low side and high side valves. The rear of the unit features low side and high side ports an oil injection valve connected to the oil injection system, an oil drain valve, a vapor outlet for the red hose, a liquid outlet for the blue hose, an outlet for the yellow service hose, a 50-pound refrigerant container, and an oil catch bottle. Before proceeding with any air conditioning system service, you should perform a complete system diagnosis. Read the repair order carefully to understand the customer's complaint and try to determine any symptoms which the system exhibits. A separate R134A gauge set is available if you don't want to use the set built into the ACR4. Make sure that this set is dedicated only to R134A use. To minimize venting of the refrigerant when you're connecting and disconnecting the ACR4 to the access fittings, be sure the manifold gauge valves and the mechanical depressors are closed. Connect the quick connect coupling. Now rotate the knobs clockwise on the coupling until the gauges indicate system pressure. Open the oil drain valve to see if the oil separator contains oil. If any oil drains into the catch bottle, allow the unit to drain until there is no more oil in the separator. This oil must be disposed of properly. Check local and state regulations to determine the proper disposal procedures. Note that this process will most likely cross-contaminate different PAG oils. This is not a problem in this instance because the oils are discarded when the process is finished. Close the valve when draining is complete. 
Now you can recover the refrigerant. Check the gauges on the control panel to make certain there is pressure. If there is none, there is no refrigerant in the system to recover, and you must follow the leak detection diagnostic procedures. You should not proceed with the recovery process, or you could draw air into the recovery tank. If there is pressure, indicating there is refrigerant in the system, open both the high and low side valves on the control panel and open both the red gas and blue liquid valves on the tank. Turn the vehicle evaporator blower fan switch to high. This will assist in the refrigerant recovery process. Press recover on the keypad. The unit will clear itself of refrigerant. CLL will appear on the display during this process. When the clearing is complete, the unit will automatically start the recovery process and the screen will show that the unit is in the recover mode of the automatic cycle. The weight of refrigerant being recovered will also be displayed. After initial recovery has occurred, the compressor shuts off automatically. At the end of the initial recovery process, the display shows CPL for complete and alternately flashes the weight of the refrigerant recovered. Slowly open the oil drain valve and drain the oil into the calibrated oil catch bottle. Read and record the amount of oil, then dispose of it properly. This oil must not be reused. After two minutes, check the control panel low side gauge. If a vacuum has been maintained, the recovery is complete. If not, there is more refrigerant in the system which must be recovered. Press the hold continue button to restart recovery. Once the recovery process is complete, you should perform the necessary repairs or services to the vehicle's air conditioning system. The next step is to evacuate the AC system. Simultaneously press reset and enter to enter the diagnostic mode. Then press seven. The display must show six pounds or more to ensure enough refrigerant is in the tank to charge the system. If there is less than six pounds, the ACR4 will not evacuate or charge the system. The check refrigerant signal will show on the control panel. To resolve this problem, you must charge the tank with R134A and then proceed. The intent of this is to keep you from wasting your time by attempting to charge a system when the container does not have sufficient refrigerant. During this evacuation process, the refrigerant is automatically being recycled, one of the main features of this equipment. Non-condensable gases, which are mostly air, are automatically vented from the tank during the recycling process. You may hear a slight hissing noise. After the vacuum pump has run for three minutes, press the hold continue key to stop the vacuum pump. If 27 to 30 inches of vacuum is indicated, close the low side and high side valves on the panel and see if vacuum is maintained. If vacuum does not hold, this indicates a system leak. You must find and repair the leak before continuing. If vacuum is maintained, Open the high and low side valves and press the hold continue key to restart the vacuum pump. Now the AC system can be recharged. Take the correct graduated bottle of lubricant and adjust the O-ring to the required oil charge level. Install the bottle on the oil injection system. Open the valve at the top of the bottle and watch the level of oil being drawn into the system. Close the valve when the required oil charge has been pulled. Next, close the low side valve. Check to make sure the high side valve is open. Press charge on the keypad to be sure the unit is in the program mode. Enter the specified amount of refrigerant charge as indicated on the vehicle label or printed in the service manual and press enter. A blink of the display indicates the charge amount is in the unit's memory. Press charge to begin the charging process. Be sure not to rock or bump the ACR4 during the charging process as this may cause an inaccurate charge. 
If the equipment is accidentally bumped during charging, you must repeat the entire evacuation and recharging process to assure the system is fully charged. The display shows automatic and the amount of refrigerant programmed for charging. At the end of the process, the display shows complete. Now, close the high side valve. Start the engine, switch on the AC system, and let it run until the low side and high side gauges stabilize. Compare the readings with the system's specifications. Now you should perform a system test. Check the evaporator outlet temperature to be sure the system is operating according to specification. For maximum charge accuracy, it's necessary to clear the hoses of refrigerant. Here's how you do that. With the AC system running, close the high side coupler valve and disconnect the high side hose from the vehicle. Open both the high and low side valves so refrigerant from both hoses can be drawn into the AC system through the low side hose. Close the low side coupler valve, disconnect the hose from the vehicle and replace the caps. The air conditioning recovery, evacuation and charging process is now complete. If you repaired a leak, recheck it. As a final step, test the air conditioning system to make certain the customer's complaint has been fixed. A properly operating air conditioning system will satisfy your customer. End part six. Before answering the last video test questions, please complete the portion of the student attendance and test form that identifies you and your dealership. If this portion of the answer sheet is not completed correctly, you and your dealership will not receive credit or certification for this course. Begin by placing the student attendance and test form in front of you so that the clipped corner is now in the upper right. Print your last name in block one located in the upper left-hand corner, putting only one letter in each box. Print your first and middle initials in block two. Print the name of your dealership in block three. Your dealership city in block four and state in block five. Be sure to use the official U.S. Postal Service abbreviation for your dealership state. Print your social security number in block six. Enter your dealer code in the space provided. Print today's date in block eight. Return to block one in the upper left-hand corner of the form. Below each letter of your name is an alphabet. Fill in the circle with a letter that corresponds to the letter of your name at the top of the column. Follow the same procedure for the numbers of your social security number in block six today's date in block eight, and your dealer code in the space provided. You should now prepare to take the final part of the video test for this course. Start this part of the test at line number 13. Question number 13. The gauge set used for R134A systems can also be used on R12 systems. A, true, or B, false. Question number 14. After the vacuum pump in an ACR4 has run for three minutes in the system evacuation mode, the vacuum gauge should read A, 20 to 23 inches, B, 27 to 30 inches, C, 33 to 36 inches, or D, zero. Question number 15. When using an ACR4, turning the evaporator blower fan switch to high will help speed up the refrigerant recovery process. A, true, or B, false. Question number 16. When first connecting the ACR4 to the air conditioning system, A, both the manifold gauge valves and mechanical depressors should be closed. B, both the manifold gauge valves and mechanical depressors should be open. C, the manifold gauge valve should be open and the mechanical depressors should be closed. Or D, the manifold gauge valve should be closed and the mechanical depressors should be open. Question number 17. When servicing an O-ring in an R134A system, 
coat the O-ring with A. Pag oil B. 525 mineral oil C. Engine oil or D. Transmission fluid Question number 18. When the ACR4 has completed the recovery process on an R134A system, you should A. Add 1 to 2 ounces of PAG oil B. Recycle the R134A refrigerant C. Recharge the system with R134A refrigerant or D. Perform necessary system repairs Question number 19. After oil is drained into the ACR4's oil catch bottle, you should A. Record the amount and dispose of it properly. B. Attach the bottle to the oil injection valve. C. Record the amount and reuse it. Or D. Save it to lubricate service valve fitting O-rings. Question number 20. When installing a service valve on an R134A system, A. A special socket is required. B. The valve is not serviceable. C. Torque the valve to 15 foot-pounds. Or D. All of the above. You have now completed the video portion of the test. The course book accompanying this videotape contains the final part of the test. Once you have completed the test, you may wish to make a photocopy of it for your records. After photocopying, place the student attendance and test form in the pre-addressed envelope. No postage is needed. Remember to complete the questions in the back of the course book before mailing the test form to CPT headquarters. Good luck!